What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guests in this episode are Megan O'Sullivan and Jason Bordoff. Megan is a professor of international affairs at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and heads the Geopolitics of Energy Project at the Belfer Center. She sits on the board of directors at Raytheon and the Council on Foreign Relations and is the North American chair of the Trilateral Commission. Jason is the co-founding dean of the Columbia Climate School, the founding director of the Center on Global Energy Policy, and professor of professional practice in international and public relations at Columbia University. Both have extensive experience working in national security, having served multiple White Houses, in Megan's case, as Deputy National Security Advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan, and in Jason's as Senior Director for Energy and Climate Change on the staff of the National Security Council. Our episode today focuses on energy policy and the immense challenges inherent in trying to balance national security concerns with international climate objectives. Moving to a net zero global economy as Megan and Jason have argued, will require an unprecedented level of global cooperation. But it will also lead to conflict along the way and inevitably produce winners and losers. While government investment and private sector innovation is crucial to managing this transition, conscious steps need to be taken in order to mitigate the geopolitical risks that this change will create, of which the war in Ukraine is only the latest example. My goal in today's conversation is to provide you with a framework for thinking about what this transition is going to look like, the challenges and opportunities that it will create along the way for governments, businesses, and investors, and what's going to be needed from all of us in order to get it right. For anyone new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. I don't rely on advertisers or commercial sponsors, which is why the second hour of our conversations is normally available to premium subscribers only. If you want access to our full episode library, as well as the transcripts and intelligence reports, which include my takeaways from every episode, as well as my thoughts on what comes next, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and get immediate access to the Hidden Forces premium feed, which includes subscriber-only content accessible directly from your podcasting app of choice. If you want access to our Hidden Forces genius community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events and dinners. Feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. And with that, please enjoy this incredibly informative conversation with my guests, Megan O'Sullivan and Jason Bordoff. Megan O'Sullivan and Jason Bordoff, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you. So good to be with you. Very nice to be with you. Thank you, Dimitri. It's my pleasure. I've been trying to get you guys on for months, actually. I reached out initially to Megan, and I was working with her PA to try to get her on for months. And I had I actually wanted to have you on separately. I wanted to maximize our time together. And I couldn't get anywhere, so then I had to reach out to Jason and try to rope Jason in to rope in Megan And so we're doing it both together because that was the best way I could get you guys both on. In the interest of time, let's get immediately into, well, actually, just give us a quick background on who you are, your experience in energy, energy security, national security, et cetera, because that's really where our conversation is going to take us. Megan, why don't you uh, start us off? Sure. I'm a professor at the Harvard University Kennedy School, where I work on issues related to foreign policy and to energy, really looking at the intersection of geopolitics and energy and the energy transition. I've been at Harvard almost 15 years. And before that, I worked for President Bush in the White House and in the State Department and in the Pentagon, working on issues not unrelated to energy, but, but more related to the Middle East, spent two years in Iraq and working on Iraq and Afghanistan. And what about you, Jason? Yeah, so I'm a professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. I also co-lead the new Columbia Climate School. And my background for the last 20 years or so has been moving back and forth between policy making and policy research. So I served in the Clinton 
administration and then was the energy advisor at the National Security Council to President Obama, worked at the Brookings Institution in between and have been at Columbia about 10 years where I started something called the Center on Global Energy Policy Research Institute focused on thinking about how we bring together the intersection, which I think is what we're going to talk about, of energy security and geopolitical stability and how do we reconcile that with the need for dramatically accelerated decarbonization and a clean energy transition. Well, you took the words out of my mouth. That's actually where that, where I was going to take us next, because it feels like now for so long, the primary focus has been on, quote, decarbonization or meeting certain long-term climate goals. And those objectives have now bumped into some other geopolitical realities around energy security. And case in point is what's going on in Ukraine right now. And we also seem to be living through a certain period of time now where many of the assumptions and trends of the last half century have either begun to unravel or have reversed entirely. And some of that, I think, has been conceded directly in the recent national security strategy document where the Biden administration says as much, that we're at this inflection point. And so what I would like to do today, the goal that I have, is to help advance a framework for our audience to begin to think about, in clear terms, what we mean when we talk about energy security, what we mean when we talk about decarbonization, and how that fits into notions of globalization and also building resiliency at home, how do those things come together in a coherent energy policy? My first question is, because I have so many, is what is the broad consensus today when we talk about the energy transition? Because I guess this word encapsulates many of what the things that we're about to talk about today. What is that consensus and who are the interest groups that are involved in making it happen? So when we talk about the energy transition, we have a fairly broad consensus, at least in terms of ambition, where most governments and many, many, many companies now have coalesced around a goal of net zero emissions by 2050. And that's roughly in line with, you know, 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. Carbon emissions are cumulative. What matters is the total stock, not the annual flow. And the stock we, other than a recession or a pandemic, that's going up each and every year, not down. You would need to first stop growing emissions and then bring them down to net zero. By that, it means you're not, doesn't mean there's no emissions and no oil and gas in a world where you stop building that total budget of CO2, that you stop accumulating more CO2 emissions, but at, for some degree of, you emit much less, and then for some degree of emissions, you remove or capture and store the CO2 that would be associated with still using some degree, but much less than today, of fossil fuels in the energy mix. What we're trying to achieve, driven by what we know about climate science and what it would take to really avoid some of the worst impacts of climate change. Maybe um, I'll just jump in from a different perspective. You started out with a very rich question, set of issues to discuss. And I think, you know, there are some big changes. You mentioned, are we at this inflection point? And I think, you know, certainly if we look at um, what the Biden administration says in their national security strategy, it really underscores how the international system is at an inflection point. And there are a couple of things that are happening that's making it a particularly challenging moment. And the things that would matter most to us in this conversation are, you know, we're in a a world where there is much more great power competition than there has been in decades. And, and that great power competition is something that is becoming the defining paradigm of the international order. So we actually just are emerging from a couple of decades where there was a lot of cooperation on global issues. But we have a situation where great power competition is really kind of eviscerating our ability to work through global institutions and multilateral mechanisms to address global problems. But at the same time, we have global problems which are becoming more and more urgent to address. So we have the you know, emergence, re-emergence of great power competition and the intensification of global problems, but the great power competition is making it more difficult for us to deal with global problems. So that's like essentially the major conundrum for people like all of us to get our minds around. You know, how can we address problems like climate change, but not exclusively climate change, also things like pandemics and still terrorism, things that are global in nature in a global environment that is largely competitive competitive and, you know, increasingly less cooperative. That's actually a great framing. I would also like to advance another framing as well to hear what you have to say about it, because I know you've talked about this before, Megan, and actually I'm sure Jason has talked about it as well, which is the short-term objectives and then the long-term objectives, balancing those two as well. That really creates a set of wicked problems. 
what are the practical steps that need to be taken? And how do we go about setting expectations? Because I think that's the other thing that is problematic for policymakers, which is that the public doesn't really have a clear set of expectations around this. And so oftentimes when expectations aren't met because they're not clear, they result in sclerosis and it becomes increasingly difficult to actually do anything on this front. So how do we begin to wrap our minds around this on a practical level? Sure. Let me start by just talking about what I think you mentioned at the beginning about how some of these priorities appear to have shifted just given the the geopolitical changes that we've seen since the invasion of Ukraine. And certainly energy security has catapulted itself again to the thing that is perhaps front and foremost on the minds of many citizens and many leaders. And so this is something that has taken the short-term advantage in many respects. And so there's the reality that many governments, many people are dealing with energy crises that seem urgent and are urgent in many respects. And as the winter progresses in Europe and elsewhere, it's potentially a matter of life or death. So that becomes a short-term priority and it has to be addressed against the longer term, perhaps less urgent in the sense of day to day, but increasingly obviously urgent. We look at Pakistan, we think about that country, a third of that country being underwater and being associated with enormous loss of life and livelihood. So there's a short-term dimension to climate, but there's also a longer-term dimension in terms of how we have to think about it if we're going to get to the goals that Jason described. So the most immediate balancing act here, I think, is the short-term objective of meeting energy security. And that's important, not just for energy security. It's also, as Jason and I have argued in many cases, it's also important for addressing climate security, because increasingly we see if we don't have energy security in the short term, it's going to be very hard to maintain the political consensus or wherewithal for taking hard steps on the climate side. So we've got that in the short term. And then in the long term, you know, we may end up taking steps right now that address energy security, but seem to work against climate security. And we have to find a way to even that out. So we're still in a position to meet our climate security security goals, which may you know, not be realized for another decade or two or 2050 or potentially even longer. And here you see you know, many governments and even the International Energy Agency, they just came out with their annual big report about the energy system saying, well, in the short term, we're making a step backward, but in the long term, our ambition and our goals and the tools that we're applying are going to make it easier to get to our long-term ambition. And I think that's certainly the objective, right? That maybe we have to adjust a little bit now to meet short-term needs in this period of crisis and unexpected geopolitical political tumult, but that we should find a way to actually use this moment to advance our ability to address climate over the long term. And I think there's no question that the ambitions have accelerated, become greater, but it is not yet obvious to me that we have been able to translate our ambitions into facts and policies, which is what is really required to meet both our short and our long-term goals. I think Megan's mentioning of Pakistan is a good example with a third of the country being underwater in meaningful part because climate change is going to exacerbate severe weather events like severe flooding, and um, but also a country that's experiencing rolling blackouts and is struggling to afford any energy at all because Europe is in the middle of an energy crisis. It's pulled in as many supplies of liquefied natural gas as it can get, driven gas uh, prices to record levels, and as a result, also driven coal prices to record levels because the gas that would have gone to Asia, they need coal instead, and that sort of takes the poorest countries in the world and leaves them out of luck. That comes to your point about our goals. What are we trying to achieve? And in the short and long term, in a sense, they're the same. We need energy to be affordable and reliable for people. You want a measure of geopolitical stability and security. So to the extent you're not empowering or emboldening adversaries who may possess energy, you you want to do that as well. And we need the energy system to become much cleaner and more sustainable and lower carbon over time. The tension is that how do we get from here to there and make sure that we are meeting today's energy needs as we undergo a process of energy transition to get from today to there where we are nowhere close to being on track for those goals. That's part of the problem, right? So you see a lot of 
demands on energy companies or on large financial institutions to stop investing in fossil fuels. Because if we were on track for our long-term goals of net something like net zero by 2050, we roughly know how much we should be investing in fossil fuels. And the answer is not a lot, if any, in new sources of supply. Problem is we're not on track for the goals. Oil and gas demand, again, other than recession or pandemic, are going up, not down. So what do you do about that? How do you make sure that you're continuing to invest adequately to meet energy needs today when the energy system globally is still 80% fossil fuels and that figure really hasn't changed for decades, but you are accelerating as quickly as possible the investments you need in clean energy in order to change that trajectory? So today the problem is that we're underinvesting across the board. We're underinvesting in oil and gas relative to the current outlook for oil and gas demand. Again, nowhere close to what we would need for our climate goals. And we're dramatically underinvesting in clean energy relative to the pace that would be needed to change that outlook for oil and gas demand. And when you underinvest, you get tight markets and volatility and price crunches and higher prices. And, and you embolden, as Megan and I wrote about earlier this year in a few different pieces, strengthen the leverage that countries like Putin have to weaponize energy, to use it as a geopolitical weapon. Because when there's very little buffer in the global market, very little ability to find other sources, little spare capacity, the countries that are meaningful energy producers are stronger, not weaker, whether it's Russia weaponizing gas by cutting gas supplies to Europe, or what we saw recently with this uh, big breakdown in US-Saudi relations because OPEC cut you know, about a million barrels a day of production. And that is very meaningful in a market with almost no ability to handle a disruption in oil supply right now because there's no other sources of supply out there. You know, I was writing furiously as you were talking, Jason. And the very last thing you said, I was in the middle of writing something in response to it. I'll just say it now. It seems that a lot of our policies are kind of at loggerheads. You know, Saudi Arabia is a great example. Up until now, this administration, and particularly the Democratic Party, had made it a policy plank to not only run on a platform of foreign policy that aligns with certain normative standards, but to actually use language to really excoriate, in the case of Saudi Arabia, MBS and its leadership. I'll just go out and say kind of what I wrote here as you were talking, because this gets to the point. There are interest group politics, there are populist politics, there's geopolitics and national security, there are problems of the commons here. I mean, this just seems like a really wicked problem. and. Again, I want to reemphasize what I said at the top, which is that I really want to help people get a mental framework for thinking about how this problem gets solved and being realistic also about how and ways in which we fall short. So practical steps and realistic, like how do we go about as a country, when given the fact that we need to work with other countries and that the world is becoming increasingly multipolar and we haven't been able to solve this problem or make the kind of progress we expected as a unipolar power or in a more unipolar world, how do we go about doing that? What are the steps that need to be taken? Where has this administration done a good job? Where has it fallen short? How much depends on the executive branch, given the volatility in American politics? How do we wrap our arms around this problem on a practical level? Again, so many things there to respond to. I think both Jason and I will take a crack at different angles on it. First, going to the point about Saudi Arabia and about the Middle East and about how do we understand this problem. I think one of the factors has been that people have generally been looking at the energy transition and thinking about the world of net zero 2050. What's the world going to be like when we get to a place where we're not emitting any carbon on a net annual basis? And so they've thought that, you know, we're kind of moving in that direction. There's some kind of linear move in that direction. And there's been a huge underappreciation that there's a difference between that endpoint, which we haven't reached and are not going to reach for some time, and the actual transition that's underway. And the transition that's underway does not just every day have more and more of the characteristics of the end state. Instead, the transition in itself is like highly volatile and very dynamic. And as a result, you have certain actors that get empowered in the course of the transition. And they're the very actors that people, you know, when they were coming at this from a theoretical perspective, thought that they were going to be the ones that were disempowered. So you asked about Saudi Arabia and about, you know, how are we having a policy that seems at cross purposes? I think the sense that we were going 
going to be able to live in a world without Saudi Arabia, where Saudi Arabia was less powerful, I think in part had to do with the fact that people misunderstood the dynamics of the transition itself. And that actually countries like Saudi Arabia and others are going to become more powerful rather than less powerful, at least during the transition period, because of the many points of discombobulation that Jason mentioned. When supply and demand are not well managed and they're not in track, then you you get, again, these traditional suppliers having outsized influence. So there's one piece of that. But getting to your question more directly, and then I'll turn to Jason about, okay, what do we actually need to be doing that can help us address this problem more? You know, there's a lot of specific provisions that we need to be doing, particular policy steps, and maybe Jason will touch on some of them in the Inflation Reduction Act. I think that the country in the United States moves in that direction in a significant way. I think we can be somewhat more optimistic that will our politics around climate change will hopefully continue to improve, in part because this geopolitical moment has done something extraordinary. It has given a very, very salient and important argument around national security to the whole argument for the energy transition. So essentially, whereas before you had a lot of people who were caring about the environment, were caring about issues of equity, a lot of very, very important issues that were related to why we needed to get away from fossil fuels. You had a good segment of the country saying that doesn't seem as important to us, or we don't necessarily, we're not bought into the same science that you're bought into. Now there's a national security reason why we should be moving away from fossil fuels. So whatever you believe about climate science, there's a national security imperative that we don't want many of these traditional suppliers of oil and gas in particular, to play this role in geopolitics. So I'm hoping that will help influence our politics that will allow certain things to be passed. And then I'll just say one sentence that you may or may not want to come back to. I think that what I anticipate we will increasingly see in the future is that while we will still continue to try to create cooperative frameworks for addressing climate, increasingly we're going to recognize that in this global environment, we have to harness the powers of competition to get to where we need to be, rather than continuing to rely on the hopes of cooperation. So that if the dominant dynamic in today's world is competition, which it is, you know, we should not think that we're going to solve the biggest problem facing us right now only through cooperative measures. We're going to have to figure out how to harness competition. What's that going to look like? I think the Inflation Reduction Act is the beginning of that, you know, but it also means that our approach to climate change is going to be quite different than we thought it was 10 years ago. And I'll stop there. And Jason, I'm sure, has a lot to add. Well, I, I not surprisingly agree, and including with one where Megan started, which is we need a faster, not a slower transition to a clean energy economy. That's important, not only for the urgency of dealing with climate change, but we are being reminded in this moment that there are many energy security benefits. The overlap between things you would do for energy security and things you would do to achieve your climate goals is meaningful, not perfect by any means. There's some tension there, but is meaningful in terms of reducing your dependence on globally traded hydrocarbons inevitably exposed to geopolitical risk, global gas markets, global oil markets, et cetera. And we can talk about what that looks like, what that roadmap looks like to accelerate a pathway toward a different kind of energy system. I think we've spent a lot of time talking about the immediate crisis, like how Europe gets through this winter. We have spent a lot of time, as we should, talking about the destination, the end state, something like net zero by emissions by 2050, and what that energy system looks like. We haven't spent enough time on what I think Megan and I have been thinking and writing a lot about, which is, again, how to get from here to there. And so when you ask, what do we need to do? We're going to have a multi-decade period where the traditional hydrocarbon system exists alongside a growing clean energy system. And that tension between the two is going to be one of the greatest sources of geopolitical risk uh, that we're facing in the 21st century. We're going to see things that are still needed to ensure energy security, like a healthy refining system. Right now, gasoline and diesel prices are high, not just because oil prices are high, but because we don't have enough refining capacity. And the economic incentive to build new refining capacity is not necessarily there when companies see the writing on the wall 10, 15, 20 years from now, and it's going to take that 20 or 30 years to earn 
a payback on their investment. So there's a mismatch in this process of transition and what that timeline looks like. In a sense, we need to rethink and reconceptualize the entire idea of energy security, which as Megan said, people largely over the last 10, 15, 20 years became pretty complacent about. We had an era of abundance and affordability. We had the shale revolution. People didn't need to worry that much about energy security, at least in the developed world. But even in parts of the developing world, the numbers were at least getting better. What we heard from the new world energy outlook from the IEA is that all the progress made to expand energy access, give electricity and energy to more people around the world in the poorest parts of the world over the last decade has been wiped out by what's happened just in the last year or two with the pandemic and the current energy crisis. So we're going backwards, not forwards. So we need a reconceptualization of energy security for a process of energy transition that will take many decades, and then think about what that looks like. Some of it builds on what we've thought about before. Uh, Winston Churchill, when he famously shifted the British Navy fleet from reliance on coal to reliance on less secure sources of oil from Persia, said safety and certainty in oil lie in variety and variety alone. So diversification, that's what we want. The fact that 90% of the critical minerals we use are refined and processed in China, probably not a good idea. We need a, a larger margin, a larger buffer to cope with unexpected shocks and volatility because this transition is going to be more, not less volatile moving forward. And then there are real energy security risks that will emerge from clean energy itself. And Megan and I wrote about those about a year ago in Foreign Affairs magazine, whether it's critical minerals or low carbon fuels that are traded around the world or potential for trade conflict. There will be fewer risks in some areas like oil and gas, but there will be new risks and we need new tools to cope with that. And right now what I see policymakers doing is often taking tools that aren't fit for purpose. The tools that were developed a half century ago to deal with the old conceptualization of energy security and trying to use them to deal with today's new risks. And I think they're not working particularly well. I want to encourage, take this moment to remind listeners who haven't heard our episode on energy geopolitics with Helen Thompson, who wrote a book titled Disorder, to go back and listen to it because we discussed that one specific case you mentioned with Churchill and the transition of the British fleet from coal to petroleum. One of the big problems that comes to mind for this transition in my mind is politics and forming a consensus that allows for continuity. You know, that's one of the things that in America we've had for really the duration of the Cold War. We've had a broad consensus around the American military. Sure, there's this agreement about what to fund, and certainly after the end of the Cold War, there was a the conversation about the peace dividend and how much we should be funding. But there hasn't really been any disagreement, at least not among those in positions of power, about the need to invest in national security. There doesn't seem to be a similar consensus today on energy policy. Am I wrong? And if I'm not wrong, how important is it to build that consensus? And how is that done? How, how does one accomplish that? Like, what are the pathways for doing that? Sure. I think the first thing you're pointing out, first of all, I wouldn't disagree with your supposition. I think there is still big disagreements on this issue. And this, I don't know if this is unique to the United States, but it may be almost unique. In most other parts of the world, there isn't a big debate about what the nature of the threat is. In most of other parts of the world, the debate is about how do we address it. In the United States, we still are at that core debate about the nature of the threat. And if we all agreed on the nature of the threat, we'd be in a much better position to take steps to address it. And so the question is, are we going to get that consensus? And my feeling is that gradually over time, the climate will take us to a place where there is more and more consensus on the nature of the threat. If you think about just what Americans, forget about Americans who are watching events around the rest of the world, but just even in the United States, watching these hurricanes, watching extreme weather events. And even if you look at the polls, it does seem that Americans are gradually coming to more of a consensus. I think this will be slow, and it certainly will be slower than it needs to be to drive the kind of policy that we need. So that leads us to the question of, well, okay, how much can we do if we don't have a societal consensus on the nature of the threat or the challenge? And here, again, going back to the Inflation Reduction Act, I think what's really interesting is that the designers of this piece of legislation 
essentially decided, okay, if we were going to adopt an approach that basically took into account the advice of you know generations of economists that we couldn't solve this problem without putting a price on carbon you know that's what we would still struggle to do but instead the sense was if we are still divided on the nature of the challenge taking an approach which puts taxes on people puts the price of carbon up is more punitive in nature is going to be very hard to get sufficient consensus for so instead the approach in the inflation reduction act is simply saying we are going to subsidize our way to a solution. So we are going to provide tax incentives, we're going to provide subsidies, we are going to make communities and individuals and companies benefit from being part of the transition. So it's not that we're going to penalize people and hope that those penalties create incentives for investment. Instead, we're going to provide those incentives directly. And I think this is a really important policy innovation because it is a way that we can make progress when we still don't have consensus on the nature of the challenge. And the big question in my mind is, is this approach scalable? So as dramatic as the Inflation Reduction Act is, it really is the most dramatic piece of of climate action on the part of the United States. As dramatic as it is, it still is probably not sufficient to the challenge at hand. And given that that's the case, can we scale this approach? And I think that we don't know the answer to that yet. I'm personally skeptical that we can actually get to where we need without ever putting a price on carbon. But you know, there's a lot of innovation that has yet to come online, and perhaps we'll be in a position where we'll be able to move forward in the absence of having those things. Yeah, I think Megan is making a really good point. You know, we're obviously a divided country here in the US. Many of the other parts of the world are as well. We sort of barely have a consensus on on many issues here, including dealing with with energy and climate policy. And that looks very different in other parts of the world. So if you were to do a poll of a room in a European or US city about the what is important, energy security, energy affordability, decarbonization, you'd probably get a pretty different result than if you did it in Africa or South Asia, parts of the world that are struggling to afford energy at all. So in many parts of the world, there are differences and there's not the consensus we need. But Megan made an important point, which is we did just barely by a tie-breaking vote of the, of the vice president, get a historically large investment in clean energy here in the US. The Inflation Reduction Act, nearly $400 billion over the next decade invested in clean energy, by far the largest investment in US history. And for the political reasons she talked about, it was not just carrots rather than sticks in the form of subsidies rather than a carbon price or a carbon tax, but it's industrial policy. I mean, it clearly says in there that if you want those tax credits, you want those subsidies, for the most part, you have to do that with materials, components, technologies, either made in the US or in some cases, North America, or in some cases, free trade agreement countries. So you're trying to build a broader consensus among people who care about climate, but also domestic economic competitiveness and jobs. Read Joe Manchin's statement in support of it wasn't really about climate that much. It was about U.S. security, U.S. strength, and U.S. economic leadership in building sectors of the economy that'll be more important over time. There's a risk that, coming back to your initial question and the topic, if we fail on some of those other measures like security and affordability, whether it's uprisings in Sri Lanka or iconic yellow vest protests in Paris or, or anywhere else, you know, I think both Megan and I worry that public support will quickly have the wind sucked out of it in terms of moving even faster on clean energy if people have trouble paying their energy bills. And it's been striking for me to see, given some of the promises that were made in the campaign, the urgency of climate, which I share. But just a few days ago, President Biden complaining that oil companies were giving their profits back to shareholders rather than investing in more U.S. production or saying we have a strategic petroleum reserve. And if the price falls too low, we're gonna buy oil to fill the SPR because we wanna prop up the price to give an incentive to producers to produce more oil. A US president, a Democrat, a leader on climate, who's saying, wait, we need more oil production, not less, because right now prices are too high, politically and economically. And that's the balance we need to strike. How do we make sure that we're meeting those goals at the same time that we're moving faster to try to change the energy mix in the future? Well, I'm so glad you say that because we're talking right now at uh, late in the afternoon on Monday, the 31st, and within an hour or so, Joe Biden is scheduled to give a a talk or a speech where the rumor is that he's going to announce some kind of windfall profit tax on oil companies. How is that consistent with solving the short-term problem 
of energy security. Well, I, we'll see. We'll see what the announcement is. It hasn't been made yet, and I think it would require Congress. I think it might be to call for support for that rather than to announce it will be done. There are historically large profits being made now by many in the oil sector because prices are so high. I think there's a view that part of that is motivated by a geopolitical crisis. And to the extent that's the case and more money's flowing to energy companies, we want to make sure that consumers are, aren't disadvantaged by that. There are a bunch of ways you can do that. But also, isn't it disingenuous for anyone to claim that the high profits that oil companies are receiving now represent some kind of additional froth to their bottom line, when in fact, it actually just reflects the cyclicality of the industry and the fact that the industry goes through periods of being unprofitable where companies lose an enormous amount of money. So, I mean, I feel like this is kind of, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but this speaks to the problem of politics, where this administration is dealing with some serious geopolitical challenges and long-term climate objectives. And at the same time, they're using, and I'm, and you guys have been on the show before, but listeners know that I am in no way political or partisan in any of my commentary or any of my opinions on this program. This seems to be driven primarily by politics, and it doesn't seem to serve those objectives. So it was kind of a leading question when I asked you, how does this really help or whatever, because I don't think it does. But anyway, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. I, I think there's, look, there's a political answer to your question, and there may be a substantive answer as well. And just a few days or a week or so before a midterm election, both sides of the aisle are playing a lot of politics, I'm sure. And so gasoline prices are a concern for voters, they're a concern for inflation, and both sides are trying to blame elsewhere. The question of substantively what one thinks of how one defines even a windfall you make a good point, which is there are periods of boom and bust. And if industry is supposed to weather the bust, then you know why is it unfair to enjoy a boom? I think there is at least a legitimate question about whether when that massive boom in prices is driven by an unjustified invasion, of, in part by an unjustified invasion of another country, and prices are even higher than that normal cyclicality, should one think differently about that? And we can come back and sort of have a, a policy debate about that. But I think you're pointing out that Energy prices are always going to get politicized, and and usually the people who are in power in Washington maybe get more credit than than is due when things are going well, and also more blame than is due when they're not. I'll give you one example. U.S. production growth, the extent to which U.S. shale, this kind of dramatic new resource that emerged in the last decade or so, can be a contributor to help stem the rise in energy prices because it grows much faster and it falls much faster than conventional oil. But that started to slow now. Shale is not rising at nearly the rate that we would have seen five, six, seven years ago at these oil prices. That is not, in my view, because of the Biden administration. It's not because of policy. It's a set of other factors and constraints, including how the financial community is thinking about the returns that they want to see from companies. So I think often policymakers get blamed, and, and they also probably get credit when it may not be warranted as well, like taking credit for the shale boom in the first place. The practical point I was just trying to make is that this administration wants to see more investment in oil and gas. But at the same time, they want to tax the profits of the industry. And those things, again, are colliding. And it doesn't inspire, it doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence. Please go ahead, yeah. Megan. No, no. I'm glad we're able to draw you out <laughs> on this, Dimitri. But, you know, I, I just want to take Jason's good comments and, and bring them up to 30,000 feet. I think there's a real opportunity here, which is that the landscape and the policy debate, I think, has changed significantly with the introduction of energy security to such a high priority, as well as the rationale for national security for the climate transition. And that in an ideal world, our government would take this opportunity to try to say, how can we actually bring together energy and climate policy in a way that provides us a comprehensive approach to ensure that we have energy security and to ensure that we actually are able to have an energy transition. And Jason and I wrote about this, I think it was back in April, perhaps, about this opportunity being one that is the best one available since maybe 2004, 2005, where you actually did have this uncomfortable but genuine alliance between environmentalists and people in the oil industry, both of them saying, you know, for different reasons, we needed to move away from fossil fuels. So this really is a moment where I think that if officials were to back up a bit and just say, rather than, you know, rolling out these initiatives one at a time, if we could present a comprehensive picture, we might be able to, you know, have everybody be a little bit unhappy, 
but overall have a better chance of meeting our multiple goals. Do you mind if I make- That's actually a really great point. Be- oh, please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. I was going to, you know, you, you made a comment just before turning to Megan, I just wanted to come back to, which was sort of trying to highlight a, a tension, if that's the right word, or disconnect, I think, in the way you were seeing it between the Biden administration saying we want to increase production and then saying we want a windfall tax. And you can talk about what the right tax rate is. I think in Norway, it's like 80% is the marginal tax rate on on oil revenue. So different countries can approach this in a different way. And even a high tax doesn't mean you're not trying to maximize a national resource like, like hydrocarbon wealth. I think there's a different tension that it highlights that maybe in my view is even more important, which is an administration that is saying we want to see more oil and gas production but we want a faster transition to clean energy and we want to move faster, including the Inflation Reduction Act, nearly $400 billion. A lot of that is going to be spent to destroy oil demand, consistent with what we have to do to get to a net zero economy. So the tension, the disconnect is how do we incentivize and should we be incentivizing? How do we make sure we have adequate supplies today at the same time that we're trying to move faster to not need that supply in the future? And that's not how the industry works. There's not a tap that you open and leave it on for a year or two and then turn it off again. It's multi-year, it's billions of dollars of investment. And this is coming back to that point we're making about the messy and disorderly transition. How do we make sure that we're not retiring traditional infrastructure before the new clean energy infrastructure is ready to pick up the slack? How do we make sure that we do have investment to the extent it's needed to keep energy affordable, but we're not locking ourselves into a future that's inconsistent with where we want to need, where we need to be in the future. These are actually hard questions and and what the right role for government policy is to facilitate retention of existing assets or some investment today, but make sure that you have a plan to allow for those to maybe be retired normally, shorter than they, they normally would be if you get close to some of those climate goals we are aspiring to. No, that's uh, you framed that perfectly, and there are the politics. Because what you're really saying is the government's got to take a loss, and the taxpayers got to take a loss. Because you want to program obsolescence, but at the same time, you want to drive investment into the space. And I couldn't agree more. And I think we agree on that 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 needs to be articulated somehow. And then I want to go back to that other point that I made and ask you again: what really is what's preventing us from, or what can you identify as the major bottlenecks to creating a kind of whole of government approach? to energy policy. Because again, as an outsider, when I hear these conversations, they're very discontinuous. You hear nuclear, there's like the nuclear lobby, all right? People that are just like, you know, or people on Twitter who are all about nuclear. You have people who are all about like oil and gas investment now, which is something we've just talked about. There are people talking about carbon capture. There are all sorts of different possible solutions to this problem, but they all need to be integrated in a single coherent energy policy that can then be sold to the American people who can become broadly on board with it. And that that consensus is bipartisan because the other problem we have in America is we have an increasingly bifurcated electorate. And what does it really matter if we have one policy that one administration has for four or eight years, and then it's completely upended by the next administration? And that holds also for geopolitics. So how do we do that? It's an incredibly hard question, in part because there is not a master planner, right? Look, a lot of times you look at these scenarios. What would it look like to get to net zero by 2050? What does that future look like? How much of this fuel or this fuel? And people will reach different results depending on you know, what they assume about the cost of different technologies. But broadly speaking, we know what that roadmap looks like. The problem is there's no master planner of the energy system who achieves that outcome. We have federal and state and local regulations. It's different in different countries. And I often, we, I'm sure Megan too, we often, you know, there's often criticism that we don't have a national energy plan, a national energy strategy. And we need more of one, but you want to be careful about that too, right? Because if we had developed a national energy plan 15 years ago, it wouldn't have included shale oil and gas because we didn't know about it. Government is not usually good at anticipating unexpected breakthroughs or, or what technologies might come. That's to Megan's point why economists tend to like something like a carbon tax or just cap emissions and then let private free market incentives figure out the best way to develop low cost technologies because we don't know if it's going to be hydrogen or nuclear or some long duration storage. That means we can put more solar and wind into the grid. But I think we have a general sense, and that's what you see in the Inflation Reduction Act, is it a broad sense of if we got significantly down the road in decarbonization in the US, we know we'd have a lot more 
things that are electrified that aren't electrified today, like cars and heating for many homes. So we need to expand the electricity grid. We know that much more electricity would come from solar and wind. And actually, a lot of that is pretty cheap now. So let's deploy and put that steel in the ground and build out the transmission system that we're going to need because we need a much bigger grid than we have today. We know that if we decarbonize transportation, for at least for passenger cars, it's probably going to be in the direction of electrification and batteries. And then we know that all of that's not going to be enough. We're going to need things to make steel and cement and fly airplanes, which are probably not going to run on batteries. And so we're going to need other potential solutions like carbon capture, removing CO2 from the air or low carbon fuels like hydrogen. So there's investment that goes into those in a pretty broad way. You know, there's some picking of winners and losers, but it actually subsidizes a lot of things to try to advance those technologies, bring their costs down, and then hopefully kind of get a flywheel going that creates a virtuous cycle where as those costs come down, more early movers and and more companies can pick them up and start to work with them. The way we have seen investments that other countries, namely China, made to drive down the cost of solar, drive down the cost of batteries, and it makes it actually affordable today, or at least in many parts of the world, close to affordable for those to be some of the uh, better options, you know, climate change aside even. I would just very simple answer, but Dimitri, I think you've you actually answered this question, you know, why is this so hard earlier? It's because it's politics. And it's because the cost of this transition, on the one hand, I think it has, you mentioned expectations right at the beginning of our conversation. I think that a lot of the expectations surrounding the transitions have not been well set. And so, you know, the idea that this can be done without painful choices and trade-offs is one that has been very popular among politicians. And I don't think that's accurate. And the reality that the cost of the transition will fall, you know, disproportionately on different people, different industries, different communities. And so there is a political discord surrounding it. And the irony is, at least in my mind, the only way we get around that is to talk about these issues in a comprehensive way, because otherwise you're just taking steps that are individual steps that have a lot of trade-offs associated with them. But if they're not taken in conjunction with other steps, then it is impossible really to build a foundation of support for these policies. So many of us who've been in the policy world often say that if you have a problem and you can't solve it, make it bigger, you know, because you make it bigger, you have more trade-offs, you can, you know, more people can be net winners from the overall approach. And so, you know, that's why I would be, you know, I'm not sitting in government. It's easy for me to say on the outside that this is a real opportunity to try to have something that's comprehensive and that it's warranted because of the nature of the challenge and the complexity of it. A simpler answer to your question about you know, the different components of a strategy. And as many of your listeners will know, there are some energy sources that are more controversial than others. But, you know, what we do see is that Congress is, you know, gradually coalescing around a certain number of things that seem to be to have support on both sides. You know, one of them is carbon capture, which is interesting. And literally uh, a short number of years ago, you wouldn't really see a lot of bipartisan support for investments in that area. Hydrogen may emerge as another one. And you mentioned nuclear, and this is somewhere where I think the Biden administration you know, probably got a lot of pressure from some constituencies you know, not to be supportive of the nuclear industry. But there's just no scenario under which the world reaches its net zero goals without a substantial component of the global energy mix being from nuclear power. So I think you've got areas like that, and one that the potential of which is untapped, I think, or not fully tapped, I guess is what I should say, is just demand reduction and efficiency. You know, it's not, and again, this is something Jason and I have written on, it's not like the sexiest topic, but it turns out it's really the only policy prescription I can think of that does three things that we really want to do right now. You know, diminishes the geopolitical influence of Putin, addresses our climate goals, and brings down the cost of energy. You know, if we can be more efficient, if we can bring down demand for energy, we can do all of those three things at once. So, you know, those are places where we can start, but obviously we're going to have to build support for a strategy that's more comprehensive if we're really going to be able to, to reach these goals, which, as we've talked about, are sometimes in tension in the time frame available to us. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree from my non-expert vantage point that uh, efficiency and finding ways to reduce our consumption 
is under discussed. Similarly, when it comes to climate change and rising sea levels, 60 Minutes did a piece uh, a few years ago with a, a climate. I forget the guy's name, and it's Dutch, so God, I can't even pronounce it. It's probably got like you know 15 consonants in a row, but. It was a really great piece, and it talked about how Amsterdam is basically built to be flood resistant and that we need to also learn to live with what's coming, that that's a big part of it as well, which is why I also kind of tried to make the point at the start, and this wasn't just a comment about climate change. It was a comment about everything, about the changing world, the increasing levels of insecurity globally, which is how to be realistic and set expectations. So last question, it seems that Europe is on the forefront of everything that the rest of the world is going to have to encounter. Both geopolitically, they're dealing with a perfect example of what we talked about earlier, which is that this is a complex dynamic system. And at various points on the continuum, various countries will have geopolitical leverage. And the Russians right now have geopolitical leverage that they wouldn't otherwise have because of their... Well, they did. I mean, that brings up the whole question of Nord Stream, the Nord Stream pipeline infrastructure and you know, I, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. We still don't know. The Russians, I think this weekend, again, we're recording this on the 31st, said that it was most likely the UK that bombed it. I'm not saying that's a credible response, but we still don't know. But anyway, the whole the whole thing in Europe is unclear. We don't know whether the European Union and member states and Germany will end up looking something like the deindustrialized parts of the United States in five years. So quick answer, we don't have much time left. How do the Europeans navigate this, given that they are dealing with the most acute symptoms of the short-term problems that we discussed? And how do they get from here to there? And how do they avoid the worst case scenarios? That's the key, right? How do they avoid the worst case scenarios in Europe? Yeah. And I think they will avoid the worst case scenario, at least this winter. Partly that's because the winter is a little warmer. Natural gas is often, you know, a big part of it is for heating. So if weather is warmer, you don't need quite as much. They did a good job of filling inventories. So their storage levels are quite high going into the winter. So they should be able to make it through this winter. And when I let's be clear, when we say make it through this winter, prices are incredibly high. This is a huge hit to the European economy. To Megan's point about efficiency, Europe is using around 10% less natural gas, not because of a planned managed strategy. It's just because prices are so high that some parts of the industrial sector that are very energy intensive have shut down. Again, this is all having ripple effects around the world and causing an energy crisis, not just in Europe, but in other parts of, of Asia, South Asia, even Africa now. They were able to build their inventories, their commercial inventories over the last year because Russian gas was flowing at some levels until recently. They're much lower now. So I think people are worried that not this winter, but the next winter and the one after are going to be even more challenging. And so there will probably need to be many efforts to hunker down to get every available source of energy of imported gas they can. Coordination among Europeans and with other countries like the US is going to be more important, not less, trying to manage this, trying to put more policies in place for efficiency and demand reduction, and then investing both in more supply. Germany is investing uh, with, with some things that can be done the next couple of years, two, three years, to bring more natural gas into Europe, and also investing as fast as they can to find alternatives to natural gas, whether that's electrifying heating or more renewable electricity or something else. But it's going to be a rough couple of years. This is not a one winter crisis. This is a multi-year energy crisis. Just very briefly to add to that, I would say it's too early. I mean, Europe has had the lead on being the most climate conscious, the most green friendly part of the world. And I think it will continue to be so. But it's unclear yet whether it can be a model for other countries because of the potential of deindustrialization, or not just the potential, the actual deindustrialization that is occurring on the continent as some of these energy prices are as high as they are. So the question is, is Europe going to be able, not just this winter, but over the next you know, decade or so, is it going to be able to to manage that triangle of industrial competitiveness, environmental sustainability, and energy security. And so, you know, I think that Europe has the best chance of doing so for two reasons that really reflect on our whole conversation. The first is they have a lot more societal consensus on this problem. You know, this turns out to be the foundation of, you know, sensible energy and climate policies. So they've got more of a consensus, not a, not a complete consensus across the EU, but they've got a lot 
more than what we've been talking about in the United States. And also, you know, this is a wealthy part of the world. They have an ability to put a lot of resources in this direction. And that's what we've seen over the last, actually, even before the invasion of Ukraine, you saw the Europeans doing extraordinary things with their fiscal budget to make the transition a priority. So in many respects, you know, I I feel confident about Europe's ability to manage it, but again, not sure how much this is going to be a model that will work for other parts of the world. Guys, thank you so much. This was an excellent conversation. How do people follow you, read any of your writings? Like, what? where do they go? What do they do? Uh, Twitter's a good place, at least for now. We'll see what happens under new leadership. But, um, but What's your Twitter uh, handle? It's just Jason Bordoff, one word, and then also the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. And that's Jason Bordoff with two yes, S, right? B-O-R-D-O-F-F. And how about you, Megan? Where do people follow you on Twitter? And is the best place to read stuff that you guys have published on Foreign Policy Magazine and Foreign Affairs usually? That's where we've been publishing a lot in the last year, but we're not exclusive to those places. I also write for Bloomberg as well. My Twitter handle is O'Sullivan Megan, two L's in O'Sullivan, no apostrophe. But thank you so much for having us. It's great to have this conversation and really thrilled to be part of what is a really impressive group of people that you have on. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you for coming Thanks on. Thanks for the invitation. It was fun. My pleasure. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation on Twitter at Hidden Forces Pod or send me an email at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>